Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. Um, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning. If you are in the U.S., it's morning. If you are in uh, Europe, uh, good evening. And if you are in the Far East, um, good night. Uh, thanks all for taking uh, your time to join us this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending on where you are, in this uh, uh, first in a series of uh, webinar we are conducting. Uh, the background... Um, that triggered this uh, series is uh, very simple. We we are, of course, on a mission to evangelize and uh, and describe the technology that's getting uh, more and more popular uh, within the investment community, uh, quantitative analysis and quantitative finance. And uh, as we showcase some of the things that we've developed here at Lucena over the course of the last two years, uh, we are frequently um, asked by uh, um, our audience, okay, this is very nice, but how do you really apply it in a real life scenario? And uh, I decided to kind of embark on this series of webinars to really showcase uh, mechanically and, uh, and uh, through example, how a portfolio manager that has discretion over the allocation and the decisions of how a portfolio is constructed and managed can use Lucena uh, effectively. Um, the notion is that you don't have to be a data scientist to take full advantage of what uh, the technology has to offer. Obviously, um, there's a lot of science behind the components I'm going to share with you today, but uh, the purpose of this presentation is really talk about the mechanic process of uh, uh, mechanical process of how you construct a portfolio and how you manage an active uh, um, investment using our technology. So let's uh, get started. Okay, a quick, uh, you know, we are going to make those uh, webinars rather short. Uh, I'm not going to be able to touch on every single uh, functionality and descriptive piece of any of all the components we have here. Uh, but um, here's the agenda. I'm going to try and go rather quickly at a high level, I'm sure it's going to create a lot of questions and a lot of uh, uh, you know, interest in uh, learning more about some of the pieces that I'm going to demonstrate today. Uh, feel free to shoot uh, questions through the dashboard. I'm joined here by Eric Davidson, our uh, VP of uh, Business Development. He's going to coordinate the questions, answer them interactively through the dashboard. But at the end, if we have time, I'll stay as long as needed to answer any questions. And just remember, there will be follow-up webinars that will dig a little deeper to any of the components that I'm going to demonstrate to you today. So here's the agenda. I'm going to, of course, uh, as, as you have to, uh, run through the disclaimer, uh, a quick overview of Lucena and what is our value proposition. Uh, what is Quantdesk? Uh, what are the five modules that we are utilizing within Quantdesk? And of course, uh, let's move on right after that into how you can actually uh, construct a uh, quant-based strategy. Uh, I'm gonna showcase a profitable strategy that I'm actually uh, showcasing and reviewing on a weekly basis uh, on our newsletter. Uh, it's called Tiebreaker. And then we're gonna go through uh, an interactive process live on Quantes to build uh, the first maybe piece of a um, strategy that uh, you know, just to show you kind of what the process, how it goes to start from nothing, you know, from scratch and build something uh, that can hopefully drive a profitable strategy. And of course, at the end, we'll have uh, time for questions and answers. OK, so uh, let's talk about uh, the disclaimer. You know, uh, nothing uh, set forth in this presentation, uh, you know, constitutes an offer to buy or sell uh, securities. Uh, this is not uh, to be construed as investment advice. Uh, we are presenting quantitative research based on hypothetical assumptions and historical information. Uh, hypothetical um, you know, hypotheses uh, could be proven false, and the historical data could be faulty. 
Uh, the back testing uh, inherently may uh, introduce flaws such as uh, hindsight, overfitting, lack of accountability for slippage, and uh, other measurements that are not accurate. Uh, don't take any of the results shown here in back test as uh, proven and uh, a real live trading uh, resemblance because uh, they may not be repeatable. Uh, investment uh, is a risky business. Do not invest money you cannot afford to lose. If you are not a bona fide or a certified investment professional, please consult one before risking capital. Uh, we are a technology company. We are not actively managing money. So just make sure that you are aware of these disclaimers as I go through the presentation. Okay, so um, look, here's a background of where Lucena really stands in this whole you know, uh, silo of uh, financial technology or fintech. The financial markets in the last few years are going through a major transformation, as you all know. Um, accessibility to data and technology become more affordable and ubiquitous than ever before. And traditional uh, investment professionals have been underperforming their respective benchmark uh, or the broad market uh, indexes for the, for the last few years. It's not a secret that, you know, last year, for example, the long short equity funds, 90% uh, were underperforming, actually losing money. Uh, the fees have been uh, under pressure due to the major competition from robo-advisors. You hear about robo-advisors in the news all the time. And uh, young and high net worth uh, clients are looking for perpetual uh, visibility and influence on their investment decisions. Um, they are hungry for the technology that will help them incorporate sophisticated uh, and active uh, investment. And, and the hottest keyword now between you know the circles that I uh, on the receiving side of, of venture capitals and, uh, and private equities is uh, big data analytics. Everywhere you hear about big data, uh, lots of funding going into big data. Uh, of course, the robo-advisors is also a big trend in the industry and uh, venture capitals uh, from the country, from here, from the U.S., are throwing lots and lots of money, billions of dollars, and sometimes through unrealistic valuations on uh, data providers. So, so uh, you know, not a week goes by in which I don't receive at least one call for, or an email from a new data provider seeking to uh, empower the investment community with signals and to drive huge returns. So the slide here represents really where Lucena stands. If you think about uh, the, 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 the ver variety of data sources that can drive an investment decision, anything from social media sentiment to news sentiment to insider buying and selling, uh, some proprietary, of course, uh, information that some folks uh, developed in-house. Of course, the traditional fundamental um, factors, uh, technical indicators. We just came back from a very uh, interesting uh, MTA symposium in New York where uh, people are making uh, incredible strides in identifying and, and uh, benefiting from technical analysis. And of course, corporate actions. And there's, of course, a lot more. But if you think about where we stand as Lucena, where Quandesk is really, we are a data agnostic kind of aggregator of multiple sources that enables um, the uh, business-minded professional to take advantage uh, of uh, each data source individually, but not only that, in combination of multiple data sources, create one cohesive strategy that can drive uh, alpha, or minimize volatility, uh, increase sharp, and it's all done through sophisticated uh, machine learning technology and market theory. So that's kind of where we stand. You know, we can consume data from multiple sources, allow our users to first of all evaluate if the data on its own merit has uh, any predictive value, and uh, once they um, ascertain that, we can recommend additional factors from other data sources on the same platform that in combination will provide even a much more honed in and successful um, strategies. So that's the notion of where we stand and we build a suite of tools to support that. Uh, so Lucena provides, of course, three levels of services. I'm going to concentrate on the first one, which is Quandesk. We have five modules. I'm going to um, describe them to you in a few minutes uh, in more detail. Uh, but many of our customers say, look, you know, I'm an RIA or I'm a wealth advisor and I don't have time to research. Can you tell me what works? And for these folks, we have uh, built uh, what we call premium uh, strategies. These are highly researched. Uh, we have an army of quants here 
that are looking for interesting opportunities, uh, you know, uh, throughout the year. Uh, and if they come up with something interesting, we spend a lot of time trying to uh, define, refine, and uh, prove uh, a strategy. And uh, if it really comes uh, and passes all the uh, the tests, we deploy it live with our clients in a model portfolio. In other words, we provide the trades before we execute them. Our customers can decide if they want to replicate what we're doing or uh, apply their own discretion. Uh, at the end of the day, we measure our success against our model portfolio, and uh, some of our compensation comes from that as well. Um, you can obviously see uh, throughout uh, the year, I'm describing two of the strategies, Black Dog and uh, Tiebreaker, and uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit uh, more detail today. But the whole notion of what we provide here, of course, we have the third level, which is more of a quant for hire, professional services for custom research, but the overarching delivery is scientifically validated investment strategy. So that's kind of a high level of what Lucena does. Uh, here are the five modules. I'm going to describe each one of them in more detail in subsequent webinars. Um, each one has its own world of uh, features and functionality that we've added over the years to really perfect and empower uh, the behavior of, uh, of, these, uh, of these technologies. So what you see on the surface is really a tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more behind the scene, but just quickly give you an overview of what we do here. We have a price forecaster, essentially it takes an equity basket and provides a future price moves market relative. It also provides a confidence measure as to the confidence the machine has in this prediction, in this uh, um, forward prediction or price forecast. Uh, the second uh, tier is uh, a portfolio optimizer. If you think about um, uh, uploading a portfolio and uh, providing some sort of uh, recommendations, a mean variance optimizer, uh, based recommendations of how to optimize and allocate your assets, your your constituents for a uh, given risk profile, high or low. We have 10 levels of risks. Uh, what's unique about our optimizer that it uses a forecaster in conjunction with the optimization. Uh, we have the option to choose it or not. And there's a whole bunch of features around that. Um, so we can talk about the optimizer um, maybe in subsequent uh, uh, webinars. Uh, the hedge finder is uh, unique to us. Uh, we provide pattern matching technology that basically, uh, given a portfolio and an equity um, uh, whitelist equity basket, construct additional uh, or identify additional securities to add to your portfolio uh, without changing the core in order to minimize volatility and maximize sharp. And uh, the hedge finder is very unique. It's actually uh, one of the pieces that make tiebreaker uh, so successful. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more today. And the one I'm going to spend more time uh, than, than the others today is the event analyzer. This is uh, an interesting uh, kind of what-if scenario uh, capability by which you can say, okay, um, you know, I have all these factors. We have 350 or so factors from multiple data sources. And you can put some hypotheses uh, such as uh, what happens when uh, uh, the S&P 500 or any stock in the S&P 500 has uh, reached a, a dead cross or a golden cross. Uh, are these really predictive as far as uh, behavior into the future? You know, not today, not next minute, but in the next 5, 10, 15, or 20 days, uh, even further than that. So, again, the event analyzer provides uh, an event-based analysis and identification over time to see if any conditions from one factor or multiple factors are predictive when they actually come together at the same time. And uh, it's I'll show you how it works uh, shortly. Of course, all of these uh, technologies can be back-tested. And we'll talk about the back tester as well. So that's kind of uh, the suite of uh, products that we have it, uh, on uh, on Quandesk on uh, our platform. It's web enabled, so you can actually subscribe uh, through a browser. So let's get uh, right to it. So this is Tiebreaker. Um, I've been sending you uh, pretty uh, perpetual updates on Tiebreaker from uh, the time we um, decided to launch uh, the, uh, the 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 live trading. You know, since last year. Um, we uh, have uh, tiebreak have gone through several iterations. This is uh, as of September, September 1st, which is the first time we started to uh, convey the uh, tilt between long and short using our, our hedger. So it's a long short strategy. Essentially, it provides uh, a weekly rebalancing of equities. Uh, it is uh, market agnostic. It's not necessarily evenly um, spread between long and short. Uh, we tilt uh, heavier on the long side or the short side, depending on the hedger recommendations and the market volatility. But uh, this has been uh, 
performing very well, as you can see, since September of uh, 2014 to date. This is as of yesterday. I um, took a screenshot as of yesterday's uh, um, close. You can see the orange represents our strategy. Uh, the green is a uh, Vanguard market neutral fund uh, as a benchmark. We also use the S&P 500, which is not a market neutral, obviously, but we want to see how we perform com compared to the market uh, over this uh, time frame. It's been doing, uh, as you see, uh, very, very well, even this year, year to date. What's nice about, the, about tiebreaker, it actually avoids a lot of the market volatility. You see all these drops here and uh, there's very small impact. Uh, on the other hand, when it goes, uh, market goes into a bullish trend, it does not uh, respond as, uh, as bullishly, but uh, in over, overall, over the long term, it's been performing very, very well, as you can see. Okay. Um, so tiebreaker, actually, if you think about how we, we built the, the, the tiebreaker um, um, model, it started with uh, identifying a scan. You know, how do I identify from the S&P 500 or Russell 1000 the most promising um, stocks that are going to move higher in the next week or 10 or 15 or 20 days? You know, one month is kind of our sweet spot as far as rebalancing. Uh, we have now uh, new fundamental data sources that extend that uh, forecast even beyond. But this is a more of an active strategy that's holding it for a week and rebalances. But what you see here is uh, a backtest of the event that drives the identification of the constituents, the long constituents of their portfolio. Um, it, you can see that the backtest is very, very strong, very favorable. Um, and again, I have to uh, make sure people understand when you backtest, um, there are so many uh, conditions that are not accounted for, and you can never expect real life scenario to. Uh, be similar to what the backtest uh, projects, right? Uh, for example, transaction cost, um, slippage, um, you know, market impact, um, even hindsight. For example, you can see I'm going with a long uh, only strategy here because I know in the last few years we had a very bull market. How does the strategy hold when you have, uh, you know, a, a bear market? How did it do in 2008? Actually, it did not do very well, as you can see here. Uh, but uh, if you go over a much longer time period, 20 years, uh, 25 years, you would have a much better um, understanding of how, um, how the strategy holds um, over time. But, but what it does give us is a very good bias, a very good identification of, okay, uh, this has promise. And the question is, can I further refine it? Because you always look to give you the best chance to be successful. So you start with a very promising hypothesis looks really good, then you start to cut it out, start to uh, put a lot of doubts into your strategy and you basically put transaction cost, uh, put some slippage, apply tax uh, ramifications. There's a whole bunch of things that can make that chart not look as attractive. But at the end of that, if everything still holds true and you still show a promising uh, trend, uh, that's a good one to take and try and refine. So how do you refine it? Imagine this is the uh, end of the process where I refine a scan to identify the best constituents to consider for the long leg of my strategy today. So a scan, as you know, every system in the world has a scan. You can find, for example, multiple conditions that we found historically when they are met have yielded a positive return on the average moving forward. It's all, of course, market relative, so it's not on the individual constituents. Uh, you know, behavior. It's really how they relate to the market. So the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. And the way we do better is how do we rank the results of the scan? So let's assume we only buy five stocks um, every week when we want to go with a long leg. So how do we refine to find the best five if I have 20 stocks that came on my scan today? Well, for that, we use the forecaster. If you remember, we have a very comprehensive forecasting capability that can give us a way of projecting price move and confidence. Uh, the forecaster, if I superimpose the ranking of the previous scan that you saw here with a forecaster, I get a much, much better result. You can see the total return here is even higher. The sharp is, a, is higher, uh, even lower uh, uh, volatility. So, so the forecaster actually adds uh, quite a bit of alpha to the 
to the result, and it shows here in, in a backtest. This is a, basically a forecast. Uh, it's, a, it's the same exact backtest as the one before. The only thing is here we have ranked it based on one of the indicators, you know, in ascending order, let's say the, the best sharp ratio, for example. Here we said, let's apply a forecast on the constituents and see how they perform market relative. So that's the uh, notion of a tiebreaker. And by the way, I'm going to shift quickly to uh, Quandes to show you what tiebreaker looks like today, because uh, we keep uh, a pretty strong tab on uh, on tiebreaker to see kind of what's happening. So uh, this is actually live. Uh, these are the current constituent. There's five longs and five short. It's not always the case. The machine uh, identifies sometimes only one short and nine longs, or vice versa. Um, actually, there's always at least five long positions. So uh, so it tilts the uh, short exposure based on volatility. But you can see it probably thinks it's pretty volatile and it does have some sort of a even, uh, even transformation or even uh, accountability between the long and the short leg. And you can see here that we are actually uh, up today and I imagine the market is down uh, slightly. So anyway, this is kind of how uh, we evaluate uh, in real life, uh, you know, a simulation of a model portfolio. You can see here uh, the performance chart uh, that I showed you before. This is as of now. This is up to the up to um, you know intraday uh, updates, and of course you can see transactions that we have incorporated in simulation uh, to replicate what's happening in real life uh, on the active portfolios. You can see all the buy and sales, you know, and you can do a lot of analysis uh, around that. So again, Quandes provide the interface to allow you to really not just uh, define a strategy but also deploy it and evaluate it over time. Okay, let's move back to uh, the uh, uh, presentation. Um, so, so if you think about the process of building a brand new strategy, let's try and build one together, and I'll show you how we use Quandis to do exactly that. Um, so it's a four-step process at a high level. Pretty simple, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, I guess, uh, obvious. You construct a strategy, you backtest it out of sample. So basically, the way you, you make a strategy, you can try to and perfect it for a given time frame. So you try to say, okay, here's a time frame that I'm going to take out of consideration when I do my testing. Let's see if I can perfect the strategy or overfit it, which is a bad term in our, in our world. But truly, if you're trying to define a strategy, you are overfitting it for a time frame. The wider the time frame, the less likely you are to overfit, but you're always going to be refining it for a given data set. The question is, and that's really where the value of that strategy, does, does the behavior that you see within in sample, within that sample time frame and data, uh, persist outside of that time frame? So you have no hindsight, you have no information, and you try to apply the same rules that had worked so well for you when you perfected the strategy in sample. How does it hold uh, in, in a back test out of sample? And of course, I mentioned before, backtest has its own problems because you can even unintentionally in, in, insert some sort of bias into the backtest. The best way to test is really to try and paper trade it or do what we call forward testing. And the last one is deploy it to live trading. The beautiful thing is that Quandesk support all of these four steps for you. It's all embedded within the same platform and you can run through any of these steps within our technology. So. Um, I'm going to show you how it works uh, over the course of the next uh, few uh, few months as we do the series uh, with subsequent uh, uh, presentations. So here's the process. I was trying to put this slide last night, and Jessica helped me kind of put it together. <laughs> uh, as you can see, it's very busy. I was trying to show the process that it'll take to get you from step one to a to a uh, finalized strategy, and I really oversimplified it here the best I could. But um, you know, people think that quantitative finance is a glorified, uh, you know, easy. You push a button, the machine comes up with a great uh, strategy, and you deploy, make a lot of money. It's really not the case. Um, I was actually uh, listening to a, uh, a, a webcast by uh, Michael Kearns uh, from uh, um, from UPenn, who is an expert in machine learning, and he spoke about you know um, reinforcement learning and and machine learning in general. And uh, at the end of the presentation, one of the students raised his hand and, you know, they all ask questions. A lot of students ask some good questions, a lot of quants asking about, about the physical underlying technology itself. But at the end of the webinar, some student raised his hand and he says, uh, ask a really strange question. He says, uh, Mr. Kearns, um, 
why do you do that? Why do you want to help the rich get richer? And uh, it was kind of totally out of left field. And he was uh, a little um, surprised in the beginning. He said, well, you know, it's a personal question. But if you're asking me if I'm advocating uh, you guys to get into the field, I, I would probably uh, recommend uh, you to be very careful before you're entering it. And the reason is because it is not a glorified job. A lot of rank and file are not doing well in the space. There's a lot of data that's not predictive. There's a lot of work that's going to dead ends. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grinding type of process that goes iteratively and it's frustrating and you don't get great results and you keep trying and trying. And those who actually are successful are very few and far in between. So um, I, I just want to make sure you have your expectations set. That this is not going to give you overnight by pressing one button, the machine goes to work and bang, you have this great strategy that nobody else has. And the reason is because this is a very competitive space. Things that have uh, become in the past uh, available because of inefficiencies, they very quickly get, uh, you know, those gaps get filled very quickly. So you have to continuously try and outdo your competition with sophistication, with innovative ideas, and of course, hard work. So if I try to make it a little bit clearer, here are the steps uh, that's a little easier to read. Um, so here's what we're going to do in the process. We're going to create an event study. The event study allows us to identify a predictive data source and features that can provide a foresight into how um, the uh, results of the scan is going to manifest itself as a profitable strategy. So that's the first step. Uh, once we identified our hypothesis and we saw that it actually has some promise, incorporate additional data sources and features to even further hone in and provide higher degree of confidence and, ret and return. We're going to back test out of sample. And then we're going to see if we can improve anything using some of the other constituents, I'm sorry, other disciplines that we have at, uh, at Lucena with Quandesk, uh, whether the forecaster can provide additional value, as I've shown you before, uh, on the uh, tiebreaker backtesting with or without the forecaster, applying some optimization, hedging, of course, backtesting throughout the entire process, and then forward tests and paper trade, and eventually uh, put some small dollar around live trading. There's nothing that can test a strategy better than live trading. And of course, grow the allocation with confidence. So when you start getting to some large numbers, you have other issues that you do not see when you have small dollars, for example, market impact, or we call slippage. Uh, there is obviously, we put a lot of money into a trade on a thinly traded stock. They can move the price of that uh, stock against you. Uh, so there's a whole you know, world of quantitative analysis and finance uh, around TCA. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you apply uh, logical uh, you know, distribution of your trades so to minimize the impact on the, uh, on the price of the stocks that you're buying or selling? And of course, uh, continuously adjust based on empirical findings. So as you find things, it's not going to be uh, once you've done and you can put it uh, to work and you can go home and get some sleep. It's a continuous updates and adjustment as you find things that are, uh, that are happening in, in, in reality and, and how do you adjust to them. In general, a strategy does not live for a long time. If it's successful, it is only, uh, it's got a short lifespan. You're going to have to reinvent uh, yourself or readjust it uh, as you move forward. So let me uh, quickly go into Quandesk and uh, show you how it's done real quick, and then we'll have some time for questions. So. Uh, this is Quandesk, and um, quickly, just to give you the overview of uh, the topology of the software, um, you have all the five components here, forecast, optimize, hedge, event, and a backtest. These are equity baskets, portfolios, equity list, equity scan. The topology is such that you are selecting in any of those constituents, any of those uh, features, you select um, a uh, equity basket, and you do something with it. On the bottom, on the left side, you have uh, some sort of a, a configuration elements that you can actually uh, apply. Uh, for example, if I want to forecast, I just press the forecast. I get a one month forecast with three months look back and I can see all my constituents with the price today, the future price, uh, change in dollars and in percent and a confidence measure with stars. You know, one star is low confidence, um, four or five stars is high confidence. This is the forecaster. Uh, the optimizer works the same way, getting a portfolio. Let's pick up uh, you know, another portfolio here. And if I'd like to uh, optimize it, I basically can, can choose how I want to optimize it. I can set min and max allocation. And I'm not going to go in detail through all of these uh, 
technologies, but just to show you kind of how it works. And I can uh, apply, uh, you know, an optimization against this technology, this, uh, this portfolio. It shows the before and after. This doesn't improve it, but you can see kind of um, some of the underlying uh, technology itself. So before and after, you can decide how you want to optimize. It also creates transactions for you to move you from the before into the after. The hedger works the same way. I pick up a portfolio. I can uh, basically take, uh, uh, let's just take another portfolio. It's a little easier to see. Uh, if I want to take a collection of uh, constituents and improve the sharp or improve the volatility of this uh, portfolio, it's very simple function. Again, I press a button, the machine goes to work and comes back to me with the before and after. The before is blue, the orange is after. You can see here it added, um, I think, 10 constituents to the portfolio, uh, either long or short, to make it uh, uh, more relevant. What you see here between those two lines is the in-sample period. This is today. This is the beginning of the look-back period. We call the training period. Uh, the blue is the current portfolio. The orange is the enhanced portfolio. This is in-sample. And what you see here into the future is our projection uh, moving forward. So you can see the before, the after, and the forecast. All right, this is just the high level, of course. Transactions are always uh, recommended here if you want to move from one uh, state to, to the other. But again, it's not executing transactions for anybody. It's going to give you as the user the ability to uh, press the button and uh, verify on your blotter before you, uh, before you execute. Okay, let's talk about the event, which is what uh, we're going to use for our new strategy. And this is the event analyzer. Uh, just quickly to uh, tell you what the event analyzer does, uh, essentially, I can take a what-if scenario, hypothetical scenario with any of my indicators. So let's say I have uh, fundamental data, technical data, social media data, uh, sentiment data, and I have maybe insider buying and selling transactions, and I have other sources. I can create some sort of a what-if scenario in any of these data points um, and go back in time and see, okay, when these conditions were met, how the stocks that, that match those conditions behaved into the future. So if I go here and uh, I basically um, create a new, uh, a new uh, event, I call it uh, Golden Cross. Everybody knows what Golden Cross is. Let's assume uh, looking at the Golden Cross uh, of 100-day and 50-day moving average crossing uh, to the upside. So essentially, we're looking at the crossing to the upside um, uh, between January 1st, 2012 and March 31st, 2012. So it's a one quarter kind of in-sample testing. And I'm gonna say, look, you know, I was told that when you have a golden cross, things go higher. Is it really true? And that's a really nice and easy way to find out. So let's see if it does hold true. I'm going to create that golden cross for that time frame. I'm going to save it. And I'm gonna run that test. So I'm looking, I'm looking at the S&P 500 between January 1st, 2012 and the end of March, 2012, all the sectors of the S&P and I'm only looking at Golden Cross. So let's run it quickly. And I'm using, of course, a very easy to consume example, but it can get really, really uh, much more sophisticated. So I got the results back. You can see I got a list of stocks that were triggered during that time frame that had a Golden Cross between the 100 and the 50 day moving average. You can see the date when, on which the uh, event occurred and the one day, 20 days price move. So you can see that some of them going up, some of them have gone down. Uh, you can see here the summary of uh, the average return from the universe of stocks that came back. You know, one day, uh, negative 12 bips, uh, 20 days, negative 28 bips, but there is some positive changes, uh, five days and 10 days. It's really not conclusive. It's not very clean and reassuring that really, if I had bought stocks when I had a, a, a golden cross, I would, I would profit, at least based on this back test, right? So assuming that I want to still move forward with this hypothesis and see if I can really refine or overfit in a way my uh, example to give me a, more, a better chance to be successful in sample and then test it out, of course, out of sample to see if it holds true. So this is where the analysis tab comes in. And what you see here is two things. Number one, you see a heat map that shows you by sector um, how the behavior is distributed. You can see that the energy, for example, or certain energy subsectors 
are doing better than than uh, than others. The healthcare, you have some good, some bad sector. You can see here, by the way, you can down uh, drill down to the various subsectors to see which one has the best return. And if I want to exclude, for example, diversified finance or financials from uh, uh, from my my scan, I can just check this off, and essentially that would not include these uh, constituents in my next scan. Well, for now, let's just not change anything here. Keep everything together. And look at the graph below. This is the event study chart. And what it represents essentially is the behavior of the universal stock that came back from the scan before the event date. You can see here that they are going higher. Uh, obviously, there's a golden cross. So that's uh, kind of obvious that they will go higher before the event took place. But what you see after the event took place is a big uh, cone that shows the variance of the potential outcomes from the stock that we, universal, we had found. And you can see in the middle here is the mean line, which is how we base our assumption. There's a small bias to the downside, but it's really kind of close to the, uh, to the midline. Uh, in other words, it's inconclusive, as I said before. Now, here's the beauty of what Quandes provides you. You see this area on the top is highlighted in yellow. I can actually highlight a desired section of the standard deviation chart, which is the uh, cone that is represented here. And the machine goes to work and gives me recommendations from any of my other indicators that if I add them would further hone in on that region that I'm highlighting. So if I want to go for the top half of my result um, event study chart, I see that the first recommended indicator is a market relative price to book ratio, which is a fundamental indicator. And it tells me here, look, if you add this, you would retain 43% of your 139 events, but at the same time, you're going to increase the return estimated uh, increase to 1.45% return. In other words, I'm going to help you identify uh, uh, how to narrow your selection even further to give you a better chance to be successful. So I want to click on that button real quick and let the machine go to work and add that to my scan. So again, it's basically adding it to the scan and going back to the same time frame to see, okay, can I improve the results? And indeed, you can see here that it's a lot more green than reds uh, relative to, to what we had before. And the chart now has a much stronger bias to the upside, right? So we have actually perfected, not 100%, but optimized the behavior of the um, universe based on factors that were recommended to us by, by the machine. Now, you can see that there are still some red spots here and some green spots. I can go and start unchecking some of the underperforming sectors. And there's a lot of them. You can see it kind of goes down multiple levels. Um, so we actually created an, a nice shortcut to say, OK, let's have the machine do it for us. I want to find all the sectors and the subsectors that have a positive return and automatically go ahead and select them throughout the entire level of uh, of, of the Gixco tree here. And you can see that some of them are now partially selected, some are completely un unselected, and I can actually run the same scan now with a sector refinement on that scan. So the whole idea behind it, we're trying to find really not, not necessarily um, um, what is the best scan, what is the best chance for us to be successful in a real life scenario. So I'm trying to make it as best as I possibly can now, the caveat is that if I have to narrow it down so per perfectly, I have very little events, and that does not provide uh, statistical significance uh, for a study. So it's a kind of catch between number of events and how far you want to go to perfect them. It's kind of more of an art than a science, but that's how you can go around, use the machine to do it for you. But here is the results of that uh, last step. You can see we have a much nicer green uh, heat map here with a 5.06% on the average. And you can see here the results of the chart shows complete and clear bias to the upside. Now, imagine this looks good to me and I'm happy with what I have here. I can save it now and say, okay, this is cool. Now, does it really work outside of the January 1st, 2012 to 331, 2012, right? So that can go into a backtest mode and see if I can, uh, I can test it. So... Um, if you run a backtest, you can go to uh, the event backtest. Let's do it now. Uh, again, I'm picking up the same event, the Golden Cross test event. You can see here I have a bunch of other events to choose from, but this is the one I'm actually currently working on. This is our event study. 
Golden Cross, 100 day and 50 day. And we added one extra fundamental factor uh, that shows, um, you know, again, it's over the, the mean. So it's uh, from 0.58 to uh, 0.99. And of course, we have some sectors now checked off, some checked on out of the S&P 500. So I'm starting with $10 million in my portfolio. I'm going to go back, let's say, uh, two years just to make sure we can uh, do it in time so we don't have to wait here for the backtest to come complete. And I can say, okay, let me see my benchmark. I can actually have a benchmark, any index or any portfolio that I currently have to kind of compare it to. Let's use the S&P total return. What this button shows me is the ability to adjust the exposure of the benchmark to commensurate with the exposure of the strategy. Why? Imagine we are in a bear market and being in cash outperforms the market every time. If I have a very um, limited event that has no, uh, no activity, I'll be in cash most of the time and I'll outperform by, by benchmark because the market is going down and I'm just staying in cash. So that gives me a full sense of uh, you know, optimism, <laughs> even though I didn't really do anything, I just stayed in cash, it doesn't really give me any merit on the strategy itself. So we added this little button to adjust the benchmark exposure to the portfolio uh, leverage. And essentially, uh, this is what he does. He basically, if I only have 5% of my money in the strategy, the benchmark should basically compare 5% of that value as a, as a comparison. What you see here is transaction cost. We're trying to simulate a true life scenario. So here is uh, how we treat uh, some of the elements, uh, slippage, uh, short borrowing, interest. If I had a short, uh, if I had a short uh, you know, strategy here, uh, commission per share, commission uh, per trade, and the likes. So how are we going to conduct the test? So we're going to go long. We're going to hold for 20 days because that's what we show we have seen in the event study. 20 days is the length of time that does not have alpha decay. So we want to stay on the trajectory of 20 days. We're going to rank it by the market relative price to book. Lower the value, the stronger the signal is. And we're going to basically maximize our allocation to five shares per per day. So if I have today, uh, let's say uh, today I have an event and I have 20, it'll pick the best five using the market relative price to book ratio and only allocate out of my cash 20%. Tomorrow I have uh, maybe another event, there will be another 20%. After five days, if I had events every day, I would be fully leveraged. And at that point, you'll wait for either a stop loss condition to occur or for the 20 days to expire before you get the next chunk of uh, opportunities. And the event does not trigger every day, so it kind of works out pretty well for us. Let's allocate also 30% of our cash as opposed to 20, because I know this is not a very frequent event given the fact that we narrow it down to only certain sectors. And here's my exit criteria. I can do no exit, I can do a stop loss, or a stop loss and max gain. Let's just try it with this uh, specific uh, condition uh, now. I'm just picking up arbitrarily numbers, and that's it. The backtest is going to work. Now, uh, this is a short backtest and a short, uh, simple um, event, so it won't take too much time to run through it. You can see what it's doing right now, rebalancing behind the scene and driving it. For really long backtests, we can actually push that into the background and allow, uh, allow you to go back and see it after the fact. But this is kind of almost finished here. It's generating the report. And uh, the report you can see, this is the uh, uh, benchmark. This is the strategy. It's not doing as well. You can see it did not do as well. And this is the risk return profile. And uh, essentially, uh, you can see here some summary between the benchmark and the result of the strategy. So essentially, we can refine the strategies out of sample. Obviously, it shows here that what we had perfected so well, overfitted, did not hold true out of sample. Uh, there are ways to refine the allocation and the stop loss and the stop gain. I'll show you an example uh, of a, of a uh, test I ran uh, earlier today. Um, he, here it is um, that actually did provide uh, promising results. Uh, you can see the report that we generate. It's very comprehensive. Anything from the before and after, you know, the benchmark and the strategy, uh, the allocation, the exposure but then it goes into a risk return uh, scatter chart. And of course you have on a month by month basis uh, returns, as well as the actual constituents and the transactions that we have simulated as we have gone through this whole 
uh, evolution of the back test. So that's kind of uh, what you would do. And you, you go back and forth and refine until you are happy with the, with the strategy. Um, I've ran over my time a little bit. I want to stop here and give you a chance to answer some questions. I'm sure there are quite a bit of questions. I'll be available on this call, but also offline. If you would like to uh, email me, um, it's available on my newsletter, uh, but it's errors at lucenaresearch.com. Uh, but uh, Eric, uh, maybe you can uh, um, jump in and uh, answer some questions or, or let me know uh, what questions there are. Sure, thanks, Yaris. Um We don't have any questions that I can see uh, that have popped up in the application, the GoToMeeting application. Mm -hmm. um, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free, and we will go um, through each one. Okay, there's a question about survivor, survivor buyership, um, and I'd like to uh, address that. So one of the things that uh, our data, when it goes back uh, historically, um, identifies uh, stocks that are dead and no longer exist. And it's very important when you look at data and you consume data that it actually has uh, the notion of uh, dead stocks because when you go back in time to evaluate a back test, you have uh, a way of comparing really what transpired during that time. If you only rely on surviving stocks, you are really skewing um, in a positive way unfairly your, your back test. Okay, uh, question about the, the forecaster, if it uses a multivariance regression. Um, so, um, um, you know, I'm going to cover the forecaster in much more detail. Uh, the technology behind the forecaster in future uh, sessions, but just as a high level, uh, we utilize a machine learning algorithm called uh, KNN, K nearest neighbor. Uh, that is the uh, factor, um, the multi factor approach to identifying historical repeatable patterns. Um, we use kind of two-step process in the forecaster. The first one is to identify which factors uh, out of the uh, 350 that we have are going to be most suitable today uh, for, the, uh, for, for, for the identification of uh, predictive behavior. And then uh, we apply uh, the forecast on top of that. Just uh, as a teaser for the next, uh, next uh, session, you can see here, this model, that's where the secret sauce kind of resides. You can see how it's composed uh, this week. Uh, it's done through a genetic algorithm that identifies, you know, through a evolutionary process of survivor, um, which uh, elements had yielded the best results historically through a one year look back. And then uh, we apply those into the look back period and identify the forecast based on that. Um, question about the, the stock universe, whether we are a U.S. only uh, or we provide international support. So I'm happy to report we are uh, now supporting every major exchange internationally. So you can do the same thing I'm showing you here uh, on any stocks uh, in any exchange in the world as long as they are traded and there is uh, historical information for them. Um, some of the fundamental data that we have in the US are not as available from some of the emerging markets. So we do with what we have, and we also uh, provide consistency uh, on the currency side. Uh, we keep everything uh, and convert them through uh, um, FX to, uh, to dollars. So uh, the comparison on the prices are done uh, on the dollar level. But again, these are all international uh, using, from, uh, using stocks from the exchanges of the international uh, exchanges. Um, one last question. I'll let you guys uh, get back to work. Uh, thanks for sticking so so long. We have, by the way, record attendance today, so I appreciate uh, really your time and uh, and your interest here. Uh, ETF uh, selections. Yes, we support ETFs, support mutual funds, ADRs. Uh, we don't support futures and derivatives yet. We are going to in the near future. You know, technology is pretty much the same. Uh, the factors are going to be different. Once we consume them, it becomes available on the platform. And by the way, if anybody has any uh, unique data sets that they would like to evaluate through our platform, we support that as well. And we absolutely do that uh, on a regular basis. Okay, guys, this is uh, 1220. We are uh, way beyond our half hour max time. And I appreciate your time and your interest. I'm available to answer any questions offline if you need to. And uh, obviously, I'll publish uh, a subsequent uh, event 
uh, that uh, is going to kind of uh, specifically talk about the forecaster in subsequent uh, weeks. Just be on the lookout for invitation from us. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, your attention. Thank you so much and have a good day. Mm-hmm.